efforts through education, through prevention and program support and in our aim to end sexual violence in Texas. Our learning objectives today will be to discover a little bit about the history of the crime victims movement, um, both in the US and in the state of Texas. Um, we're gonna walk through the different types of crime victims rights that we have here in Texas um, and, and talk about how it's not just uh, statutory. We also have rights in our state constitution. Um, and then very briefly at the end, we'll discuss a little bit about uh, enforcing and asserting the rights on behalf of crime victims. So we have a lot to cover, so let's get started. This is a very brief sort of overview of the history of the crime victims movement in the US. And we're gonna walk through the steps here. Um, it's important, I think, to see just briefly where we came from to understand better kind of how we ended up today, where we are today. So if we uh, look way, way back, uh, when we began as a nation, uh, we just adopted what was the common model in Europe at that time, and which was a private prosecution model. And this was a system where victims were actually in charge of their own case. They acted as an investigator and prosecutor. They didn't have the systems in place that we do today. Um, so it, with this system, you know, the, the crime itself was considered to be a, a personal attack against the victim and not um, a crime against society as, as we look at it today. So this is actually the foundation of our system. Obviously things have changed. Um, and as we moved into the early 20th century, we'd shifted more to a, a public prosecution system. Industrialization brought about uh, a lot of more government control over operations of our society. And, and this included certainly law enforcement agencies and prosecution offices being created. And slowly over time, the victim was phased out of the process. Uh, eventually, you know, the, the victim was considered basically just a piece of evidence um, and, a, and a star witness, but, but there was no uh, cooperation sought um, or, or discussed through involving the victim into the process. So this obviously would have left, led to an alienation of victims um, and, and created a very imbalanced process, which only really worked for the lawyers that were in charge of the cases. Sounds a little bit like what we've got going on today. But there was, in fact, a crime victims movement that gave birth in the, in the 1970s. There was a, a court case that went up to the Supreme Court, um, Linda R.S. versus Richard D. And basically, the, the facts were that Linda was an unmarried mom. And she was asking the prosecutor in her local jurisdiction to file uh, criminal charges against the father of the children for failure to pay child support. Um, prosecutor didn't want to take the case, just ignored her. And she filed suit saying, look, you know, this is a bias that you have. And, and she was seeking to have the, the court force the prosecutor into prosecuting the case. Well, she didn't win her case, unfortunately. The Supreme Court did acknowledge she has no standing in this case as a victim. But what they did that was very important that gave rise to this movement is they said, you know what, Congress can actually enact laws that would create legal rights, create standing, so that a case like this could be brought in the future. So that was actually very good uh, because it opened the door to what, the, what laws we have in place today. Um, the 80s, Ronald Reagan created a task force that took a look, a greater look in detail at uh, the status of crime victims and determined that this is a system that's appallingly out of balance. You know, um, that, that the, treat, the victim is treated with institutionalized disinterest. Like these, these are, this is a system that needs to change, right? So uh, the pendulum began to swing. Uh, 33 some states created uh, statutes and it amended their constitutions, and Texas was one of them. In 1985, we enacted our uh, Crime Victims Rights Act, and a few years later, we also amended our constitution and created a Bill of Rights for crime victims. And many, many, many years later, we added additional rights for specifically victims of sexual assault, abuse, stalking, and trafficking. So this slide is really just to point out that uh, the federal and the state system um, are pretty closely linked. Um, I, I just wanted to show you how this, this list here is, is all the federal uh, provisions that exist and in their Bill of Rights for crime victims. And the ones that you see in red, however, 
are the ones where this, the state of Texas actually does not have equal rights. So, so the ones in blue, both federal crime victims and state crime victims have those rights, right? It's an overlap. But in the ones in red, only your victims of federal crimes have a right to, to have those, uh, like the right to be reasonably heard, the right to reasonable conference with the attorney for the government. Um, those rights are just rights that you would have in federal court. This, I think, is important to, to look at because I think this is fertile ground for us as a movement as we try to seek more um, uh, robust rights for our crime victims in Texas. These are areas that maybe we seek new legislation in our Crime Victims Rights Act. So I just wanted to point that out. And also, you may be helping uh, victims who are, in fact, in federal court. So knowing that these are all rights that they can avail themselves of. So essentially, who is a crime victim in Texas? Who is entitled to rights on, in the criminal justice process? Um, they are often, sadly, treated as pieces of evidence still. They are more than evidence. We know this. They're people. Uh, that seems obvious, but they are people who have suffered personal injury or death due to this very specific list of crimes here. Um, that's not to say that, in fact, there are other crimes where, where people are victims of, but we're talking specifically about their ability, their eligibility in this process to seek enforcement of their rights. And this is the specific list of crimes uh, that where victims can seek enforcement of their rights. Okay, so in addition to victims, um, legal guardians also can stand in the place of victims to seek uh, crime victims' rights, and, and if the victim is deceased, they have close relatives that, that stand in their shoes. So the catch-22 here is that it's actually the state that's responsible for enforcing crime victims' rights in Texas. And if you're concerned, this seems kind of like a rigged system, you might be right. Um, often the law enforcement officials or the prosecutor are them, themselves the ones that are ignoring a victim's legal rights. Um, so then how do we then go back to these same people to say, well, you're supposed to be enforcing them? Well, you do it just that, just that way. You, you as an advocate um, or as an attorney, um, it's your job to hold these officials accountable. And, um, you know, maybe there's, there's creative ways that we can go about that. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that more at the very end. But just uh, just know that it's our job to make sure they are doing their job. Um, and as we think about, you know, who we could talk to, certainly the people on this list are people we can talk to to complain that 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 someone's rights are being violated. But there might be others that you can consider, other uh, officials within the state of Texas that you could consider moving up the chain. So essentially, we're going to find all the list of crime victims, not in just one place. They're all scattered everywhere, right? So we've got a federal constitution that has a Bill of Rights. We have a state constitution that has a Bill of Rights. We have all kinds of state statutes, not just the criminal, uh, not just the, the Chapter 56 of the Crime Victims' Rights Act. We have many statutes that give many different types of rights and, and explain those rights better. So I just encourage you to essentially be a rights detective as you are helping survivors think through, uh, you know what, if, if this statute isn't helpful, look for another one because you'll probably find one somewhere. To start uh, looking at the Texas Constitution, you'll notice as we get into the uh, Crime Victims Rights Act, there's a lot of overlap between the Constitution's Bill of Rights and our, and our st state statute, but I, I have in red here the, the treated with fairness, that a victim has a right to be treated with fairness and with respect for their dignity and privacy. So that's a very specific right that isn't found in any specific statute um, that I have found. And I think it's an important one because it's one that can kind of cover the waterfront of, of injustices that, that victims um, are encountered by. And so just realize that you know, as you're talking to prosecutors or law enforcement, as you're dealing with issues that arise when you're helping a victim, if they're not being treated with fairness and respect, that is a constitutional right that is being violated. Um, and certainly feel free to, to cite this if, it, if the need arises. So here's essentially the main topical areas 
that uh, victims have a right to all of these things, right? And, and I just want you to think about that from here on in the webinar, we're going to be looking at basically the map of rights that, that are afforded to victims. And each of these topics is basically a neighborhood on that map, right? And so we're going to take each of these neighborhoods and walk street by street and look at the details that inform each of these rights, that, that um, support each of these rights. And so we'll begin with the right to safety during uh, bail bond consideration and in the prosecution process. Um, we know that the Code of Criminal Procedure gives victims the right to adequate protection from harm as they go through the prosecution process. Um, and, but also uh, there's provisions for the uh, judges, magistrates have to take, a, take the victim's safety into consideration when they're making bail determinations and even keeping uh, family violence offenders on hold for longer, uh, if, that's, if that's what the, the needs dictate. When a victim comes to court to testify, uh, they have a right to be safe in that court. They have a right to a waiting area that's separate um, before they, they go in to testify. And if, if there's it's a small courthouse, there's not really anything available, then they need to take safeguards to minimize that contact with the offender. So, um, so that's something also that's important to keep in mind. Um, you know, if, if this isn't being done, you know, an, an advocate really needs to speak up. Of course, I don't have to tell you, we know all about protective orders. And if you don't, you know, don't hesitate to contact us. That's a whole separate training we can provide. Uh, but, you know, certainly this is just to illustrate that there are these measures that the law provides to provide protection to victims outside of court. Uh, whether they get it through the magistrate process or after the fact when um, the offender's been released, um, after he's been arrested. And, um, you know, there's different kinds based on family violence or if you have been the victim of sexual assault, stalking, or trafficking. There's specific rights um, of, of being informed of the, the 7A protective order. Um, basically, a victim... Um, is supposed to be informed by the prosecutor that the prosecutor can file a PO or by, uh, by him, or him or herself or by their parent or guardian if they're a minor. And they're supposed to be told, you know, which court to file that application in. So this is information I think that a lot of victims are just unaware of that this is even an option. Well, now we have a law that says the prosecutor is supposed to tell them. Um, also, if they are in court uh, during the conviction, um, during the hearing or the trial where the defendant's being convicted or given probation, then the court is supposed to tell the victim that they have a right to file an application for a, a PO. And of course, if uh, the victim's not interested in a, uh, a protective order, it's just a little too formal and they, they're not interested in that, they can seek certain bond conditions. Um, there's, there's all these different types of uh, measures that can be taken into account in a, in a bond. And children uh, under the age of 12, they can be given a no contact order, which would supersede any uh, existing custody order. Um, if they are 12 years of age or younger, the magistrate might uh, be able to, might decide to go ahead and, and put that into place to, to protect them. So moving out of the safety neighborhood, now we're moving into the right of information neighborhood. Um, there's a, a long, long list of things that we have in statutes that, that victims are supposed to be informed about. Some different people are supposed to have the responsibility to tell them about certain things. So uh, principally, we have the crime victims compensation uh, system. They're supposed to be informed about that. They're supposed to be informed about social service agencies like the rape crisis centers around the state or family violence program that's nearby. Um, any, any of the procedures involving uh, the criminal investigation or prosecution of their case, proceedings, um, all the way through parole. And whether the defendant's in custody, whether he's released, whether he's on probation, and certainly the evidence collection and testing. They, um, they're supposed to be informed about that. And I know that's something that comes up quite a bit, um, especially in, in sexual assault cases. So um, taking a closer look at their right to information uh, for, for evidence, you know, um, 
it's, it's important to remember that they are supposed to be informed in a timely manner uh, about any evidence that's collected, what the status is of that uh, evidence and whether it's being analyzed, when it's being analyzed, um, when the request is submitted to the crime lab, which is supposed to happen in a timely manner, and if there's any hits uh, when it's uh, entered into CODIS. Certainly there is some fine print um, to this statute, so don't miss that. The victim actually has to take the step to ask for this information. They have to provide um, their, their current address and phone number. If that changes, they have to provide notice to the DA and law enforcement that it's, that it's changed, that they will be assured of getting this notice. Um, and the good news is if the victim is just not feeling comfortable to share their, uh, disclose their address in that way, they can just nominate that a point, a different point of contact be given that information. So that might include a sexual assault program. Um, just, just keep that in mind. So this is just another long list of things that law enforcement is required to provide um, the victim and then the prosecutor has a similar list. Um, and the, the key thing to remember here is that, you know, this is a list that's supposed to be given to them within 10 days of indictment. So pretty quickly, they're supposed to be given this form that gives them, you know, all these all this information. Um, additionally, uh, any kind of schedule, uh, court schedule hearings, trial dates, any changes in those uh, dates, uh, the victim is supposed to be given notice of all of that and if there's any request for continuance in particular. Um, if there's a plea bargain, uh, any of the agreement terms are supposed to be discussed with the victim. They don't have a right to, you know, control the, the process, but they do have a right to at least know what's happening about their case. And also, um, any written notice given to the victim should set out that the victim imp impact statement will be considered um, before a state enters into a plea bargain agreement. So now we move into uh, a victim's right to be present and to have a voice in the process. You'll see I have um, sweet little Ariel from Little Mermaid. Um, and the reason I have her here is because I kind of think of her as, as the, the victim that the prosecutor would like to have or that the court would like to have seen, but really not heard, right? So so that's just a fact. And, uh, you know, Victims don't get the voice that they should have, I think, in, in courts, but um, they're given some opportunity to give uh, information about how the crime has impacted them. And of course, we see that with the victim impact statement. They have an opportunity to provide that for the sentencing and in, you know, the, later on in parole proceedings before a parole board um, issues a release. And so, so that's one big way. Certainly, they can testify um, and, and give their um, their voice in that way if, if it gets that far in the process. Um, they, they do have a limited right to be present at public court proceedings, but the court has to uh, find that it's that it's not going, that their testimony is not going to change if they're listening to the testimony of, of other witnesses. So that is a consideration that's kind of up to the judge, but um, there is a limited right if the judge allows that. And um, in order to make them available, they have the right to have the DA notify their employer to make it easier for them to be there. And certainly for victims that are young, uh, under the age of 17, um, then if there's a, a a request for continuance that's requested by the defendant, um, the court's supposed to consider the impact on that minor victim. Now, this is a big one. It comes up, I think, the most um, in our sexual assault cases, which is getting your evidence to begin with. Um, I think it's not a surprise to probably any of you that there are two uh, different avenues to get a medical forensic exam done. Um, as long as you uh, show up at either a law enforcement office to report or if you show up to a healthcare facility to have the exam done within 96 hours of the assault in either case, um, you should be, you, sh you are entitled to a medical forensic exam to be given to you and you should be administered one um, without any further delay. However, I'm sure you've heard that there is a, an exception to that rule, but it's a very, very narrow, narrow exception, kind of like this sad 
tiny sliver of pie that you see on the slide, it's it's just almost never happens. It's, and and that's what's frustrating when we hear this exception given. Um, but essentially, if the victim does have a history of making false reports and there's no corroborating evidence in this case, then you know a, a law enforcement agency can can refuse the exam. But you know if there isn't a history of false reports, then then that 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 exception doesn't apply. They don't have discretion to refuse. And I know that the experience of victims around the state is somewhat different. Um, and I and I I don't really quite understand because I feel like the law is clear on this point that they are entitled to the exam if there's no history of false reports and if they if they report within 96 hours, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, if you are seeing issues like this, I, I hope that you will contact TASA and, and we can talk through some, some options and some ways to advocate on behalf of the, the victim. So in addition to being entitled to get the exam done, it should be free to the victim. And you know, just to make it clear, we're talking about the forensic portion of the exam. Um, there may be medical uh, that comes up that you know maybe they get uh, prescribed some medication for some pain or maybe they've got some injuries that are treated that that aren't related um, that that medical portion isn't going to be covered um, you know by law enforcement or by by DPS but in fact if it's just the forensic portion of the exam law, law enforcement is supposed to pay for that um, if it's a reported case and then the OAG re reimburses them and uh, if it's a non-reported case, then DPS pays, and uh, of course they also get reimbursed by the OAG afterwards. Now, for the medical uh, expenses that you know aren't covered, um, that is something that CDC, of course, can be applied and 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 used to be reimbursed uh, the, the the victim. So, and I and I see the the question: Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? It is in your materials and will show up. Uh, along with the evaluation about an hour after this presentation. So yes, you will have access, absolutely. Um, so in addition to it's no cost and, and they enti they're entitled to the exam, the law enforcement and prosecution cannot require the victim uh, as a condition of getting that exam. They cannot require them to participate in the investigation or prosecution. So it can't be like a quid pro quo situation. It can't be like, you know, um, well, you can get the exam, but you have to, you know, comply and do all of these other things. No, there's no strings attached. The exam is 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 an absolute right. So just wanted to point that out. Now, what if the victim appears at a health care facility, but it's not safe ready. Well, first question might be, what is safe ready? This is sort of a relatively new provision in the health and safety code that came about about two years ago. Um, so a safe ready facility is, is one that, that actually does have a contract with or, or actually has SANES on staff, certified SANES. Um, they're considered safe ready if, uh, if you're not a safe ready facility, if you're a hospital or, or healthcare uh, facility that is not safe ready, then what you have to do is give victims a standard information form that tells them where they can go, where, where, where's the closest place for them to be transported. And um, that facility has to transfer the victim uh, there, but they're supposed to first uh, determine if the same nurse is available at that facility. And they have to give the victim the choice, right? If, if they've explained the benefits of going to a safe ready facility and the victim still chooses to stay where they are and have the exam where they are, then they have that right as well. Um, and, and a victim um, can't be forced or coerced to go to another facility just because the, you know, it's easier on, on the system to do it that way. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Again, this is another thing that I know is uh, out of step with the experience of many victims. I know that I hear stories all the time, victims being sent around the state to different places that, you know, that they didn't want to go, but they were told they had to. That's just, you know, a violation of their rights, unfortunately. Um, and so that's just another thing to keep in mind um, as, as we're advocating for, for our survivors. So there's a number of rights that a survivor has uh, before, during, and after their exam. They're supposed to be given you know, a private waiting area, a private treatment room, 
Um, we all know they have to be given access to a community-based advocate. That's not routinely done, but it's certainly listed in the health and safety code. Um, and in fact, it's such an important right. Uh, we see it again in the Code of Criminal Procedure. And I know that this is a very familiar provision to many of you. Um, I list it here in, in, in quotes so that it's uh, easy, easily accessible to you if in fact you have to advocate on behalf of the victim to be present in that exam room when uh, you know, we have law enforcement or even the healthcare facility or even the SANE nurse uh, saying otherwise. This is a pretty clear cut that if you are an advocate from a sexual assault program, you, that you've completed your sexual assault training, then you, know, you are entitled, well, the victim actually is entitled to have you present if they choose that. So um, that's, a, that's just an important one that we see pop up again and again and again. Certainly there's limitations of, of what an advocate can do within the exam. You can't delay uh, or impede the exam in any way. You, you're supposed to provide counseling and other support services um, and, and just you know, their information on their crime victims' rights. You're not uh, really supposed to do anything else, just uh, be there as their support. Um, I, I think that's typically the case, but just to let you know, there's a, a limit on, on what you can do. Yes. And I'm there's sorry, Wendy. Question. Oh, there's does a question. It, does the same need to wait for the advocate to arrive before the exam starts? Yes, they're supposed to have them present during the exam. So that would entail at the very beginning, you know, uh, because at, at any point, uh, it, it may be that the victim decides they don't want to continue and they need to have a safe person to speak to who would have that, that duty of confidentiality that they don't have with just with the same. Um, so that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Um, so I know you all know this as well, but uh, victims have the right to have the evidence submitted for testing. And this has, of course, been a big problem. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading now. Thank you. Many times my advocates arrive and the exam is already done or in the process. Yeah, that's a violation of their rights. That is absolutely a violation. And that's something that probably we should talk about, but that that that, that needs to be brought up with the uh, whoever in your community is, is handling those exams, that they need to be educated um, about that point, that that is in fact a violation of their crime victim's rights. Because uh, otherwise, what's, what's the point of the law if you have them, uh, if you call them, but then the exam's already done? So that, yeah. I, I appreciate that point being brought up. Um, so we're all really well aware of the the uh, same kit backlog that we had in the state of Texas as well as around the, the country for that matter. Um, and it's being resolved slowly. Um, the, uh, the point here to take away is that actually the law states uh, that, that, that it, the kit is supposed to be submitted to the crime lab uh, no later than 30 days after law enforcement takes possession of the evidence and that, that a DNA database comparison is required. I know there's been other uh, legislation that's been brought forward in this session specifically and in, in last session about timeliness of, of, of how that's tested and everything as well. So this is just another thing that uh, just to keep our eyes on. And I, and I do think within the amount of dollars that are being put towards this issue, this is being resolved. It's just, it is gonna take some time and in addition, um, we want to have our evidence returned. You know, there may be um, things that the law enforcement take that they needed for the case, but once the case is over, um, you know, they the victim might want that back. So uh, it's important to know law enforcement is supposed to, to, to provide, or the state, whoever's in possession of the evidence is supposed to provide that evidence back to the victim. And of course, um, while they're receiving medical care uh, for their uh, for the offense that occurred, they are they have the right to be tested uh, free for AIDS, HIV, um, and they have the right to have the defendant tested. So that's kind of an important one as well. I think that I think it's overlooked. That brings us to privacy, which is a whole. Um, twisted ball of wax, honestly, um, because it's another one of those that's that's limited. Um, we have certain provisions in the law that provides for a victim's right to privacy, but as you can see, this uh, 
this creepy guy in the pictures peeking in the peephole that's kind of like the not just the defendant but the the public at large that that are just wanting to know everything about everybody at all times so um, while we do have statutes that attempt to provide this protection of privacy um, they fall short in some cases and certainly there's many 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 exceptions to the general rule um, so we'll dive into first contact information private privacy in that uh, area um, you know certainly we know um, the address and phone number of the victim should never be part of the court file um, in, unless the, the address need is needed to identify where the crime occurred. But um, but if the victim moves and changes address, that, that should never be included in the court file. Now, as an additional layer of privacy protection, they can ask for a pseudonym. Um, they choose the pseudonym. Um, and they, they have to kind of work that out through law enforcement. There's a form um, that they can get through the OAG. Um, they have to sign it and have law enforcement sign on to it. But as soon as that's done, uh, that's the name that's used in all the reports and any if there's a press release, if there's any kind of uh, public records, that that's the name that, that's going to be used. And um, so that's, that's something important to consider that I think a lot of times is also overlooked. Um, another a uh, measure of safety and, and protection of privacy is the Address Confidentiality Program. The OAG does maintain uh, this program and, um, you know, you do have to apply. You have to be a victim of family violence or sexual assault or stalking. Um, I don't believe it covers trafficking victims just yet. Um, but if, uh, if you're eligible to apply and, and, and eligibility is based on what proof you have, so if you have a protective order that can be used as proof, if you are um, in a, a criminal case, um, you know, if, you're, if, if it's being prosecuted right, right then, like all those things are, are ways to prove that you are in fact a victim that is entitled to be included in this program. So you, you would make an application, file it with the OAG. OAG um, can establish a PO box then um, for that a victim to use. And uh, so then anytime the victim has to put down their address, on any kind of form, they would use that P.O. box. All the mail then gets sent there, and OAG handles the, the free forwarding to the victim's real address. And of course, that real address is confidential information and not subject to open records requests. So it's a good program. It can be cumbersome. It can be cumbersome for a victim because um, there's a delay, certainly, uh, on, on their mail. But, uh, but anyway, that's something to, to consider if you have a, a, some severe safety concerns and need for privacy. And certainly there's certain communications and records that are considered confidential. And, um, you know, while the, the OAG has, has a blanket confidentiality on, on all of their uh, information that they get from victims, uh, rape crisis center advocates and family violence uh, programs also have duties of confidentiality, which I'm sure y'all have uh, encountered in, in your work. Um, any communications between an advocate and a victim is considered confidential. Um, any records kept by the agency, by the program, is considered confidential. Now, this doesn't always equate to, you know, privileged. In other words, it doesn't always equate to being kept out of court, right? So that's where some of these uh, exceptions come into play. And I could do a whole nother hour just on confidentiality uh, provisions and the exceptions that that uh, apply, um, there's many, but essentially just know this is just another way the law does try to provide some measure of privacy to uh, survivors. And if you have specific questions about does this exception apply, do I have to provide this information, you know, I'm being subpoenaed, that's the big one that comes up is, you know, you have um, prosecutors uh, or defense counsel subpoenaing uh, records, um, asking for advocates to come and testify, and that's really where it gets sticky because there is a statute in, in our government code that, that allows those subpoenas to, to be sent, and, and so then you kind of have to deal with, like, you know, talking to an attorney, trying to file a motion to quash, trying to figure out what to do to keep that information out, but just realize there's an attempt in the law to try to keep that information private, if at all possible. 
So finally, we are down to the right of restitution. Um, and, you know, this is one I think that's widely overlooked. I don't know why, but there we do have uh, a statute where um, crime victims are, it's a very robust statute actually, um, goes into quite a lot of detail about the restitution that a victim can apply for, um, for any expenses that they've incurred as a result of the offense. Um, and we're talking about un, you know, uh, unreimbursed medical care costs, like out of pocket, uh, lost wages, things like that, that they haven't been reimbursed for, um, they're entitled to be made whole. Um, and that's something that the prosecutor is supposed to seek on their behalf. Um, and, and it's something actually that's supposed to be inquired into by the judge. Oftentimes it's not, but it should be, and it's supposed to be. Um, and, you know, it, it may be, you know, you hear the expression, you can't get blood out of a turnip, turnip. Well, you don't have to have the payment, you know, all at once. It can be ordered to be paid in installments. Um, and it, and it can also be made, uh, maybe because of CVC is the question. I mean, Perhaps, right? But there's still going to be costs that CVC maybe doesn't cover. Um, and actually, CVC is um, that that fund is one of the ways that restitution can be paid. There's there can be something in the order that that requires the payment be made to CVC if they've already made. So this would only help our state, right, to get this this money back from the the true offender, right? So um, I do think it's something that that should be followed up on more than it is. Um, it can be made, you know, one of the conditions of, of probation or parole. Like if, if they aren't paying their restitution, they get revoked, you know. So anyway, enforcement of that is done by the state or the victim can do that civilly in a civil judgment. They need to hire, you know, um, counsel probably to help them with that. But um, certainly if we're talking about a lot of money, just sort of depends, I suppose, might be worthwhile. So this brings us to the enforcement of crime victims' rights. The, you know, the problem with enforcement in the state of Texas um, is it feels like it's just words on paper, right? And and I, I wish that it was different. There's uh, lots of states that that give um, victims, and including the federal system, as we as we discussed earlier, gives victims the right to standing in the criminal proceeding. They have a right to hire their own attorney to sit with them in the case, in the trial, um, to represent their interests, their crime victims' rights, right? Um, we don't have that very well in Texas. Um, we've got these rights, there's a lot of them, um, but we don't have a provision for standing. In fact, we have the opposite, as you can see here, that we have an actual statute that states victims don't have standing. <laughs> and they don't have standing to contest, you know, how the case comes out. Um, that doesn't mean, I don't think though, that we can't still help them assert their rights, right? We can speak on their behalf, even though we can't make the decision. And while the, the judge, uh, the prosecutor, law enforcement, th there's a statute that says they're not liable <laughs> if they neglect to do their duty. They're not civilly liable. We can't sue them, right? We can't do, what Linda back in the 70s tried to do. Um, but what we can do is try to hold them accountable in other ways, in more creative ways, think outside of the box. You know, the court of public opinion can be very powerful. You know, maybe we have a press, re press conference to talk about this ongoing in the epidemic of a failure to acknowledge crime victims' rights. Maybe, you know, we go up the chain and talk to our legislat legislators and, and talk to them about some other bills that they could file to really enhance um, crime victims' rights and really make it uh, a system that, that's fair and works for the survivor and actually does protect their privacy and dignity in a meaningful way, right? So um, in, in some states that have um, a little better system for victims, uh, I know that there are, there's attorneys that will file motions in court um, asking for their specific rights to be um, enforced. I don't know why we can't try that in Texas. If you could get attorneys to stand up to try um, filing a motion, you know, it just takes one case, right, to challenge laws. It takes one case, and and if it makes its way up to the Supreme Court, that can change an entire system. So, you know, it can start a movement, as we've seen 
that's what happened in the 70s. So this is just something to think about. Um, we're not completely powerless, although we may not have as many um, powers that we that we want to help crime victims. But but I do think that there's hope and then there's options available to us. Um, I did uh, borrow some of uh, NCVLI, that's the National Center for Victims, uh, Victims Law Institute, um, for, for their history lessons that we talked about at the beginning, so I wanted to give citation to them. And I'm open to any questions that you might have. I realize that I'm ending quite a bit early, and I apologize for that. I think I just talked a little too fast, but I didn't want to read my slides to you, so I, uh, but I can certainly go back if you have questions about anything specific or want to um, discuss anything in more detail. And also certainly know that um, TOSS is here to help. Uh, there's technical assistance that you need or legal questions that you want to have answered. Um, I've got my contact information on the screen and I am happy to respond and answer any questions. We take training requests. If you, you know, need us to come out to your area, we'd be happy to talk to you about those options of, of, of us coming out and serving you in that way. Don't be afraid to give us a call or email us. And Wendy, as well as myself, we um, we love to we love to work together to to make it better for for survivors. So, um, yeah, the PowerPoint slides will come to you um, in about an hour, and um, we can find victims' rights. Yes. Um, so the compilation is basically this PowerPoint. Every slide, pretty much every slide, has a statute um, cited, um, and if it doesn't, it's because it's several statutes kind of on the same that are represented on that slide but most all of them do have um, citations so um, just if you have any uh, trouble finding them again reach out ask me I'd be happy to point you in the right direction or, or send you the specific statutory language but most of it is in this PowerPoint and and like I said once you uh, receive the evaluation in like about an hour it's supposed to the materials the the PowerPoint is supposed to come to you as well if for whatever reason that does not happen email me uh, write down my email uh, evoice at tasa.org and and I will make sure to, to to send it to you so it, are, if there's no other questions um, then I think we will go ahead and sign off for today. I appreciate your time and attention. And okay, uh, one more question. I was not aware that victim can request prosecutors to file 7APO. They're supposed to tell victim where I can find more information. Yes, that is in the, um, the Code of Criminal Procedure. Um, so that is one of the, uh, the rights that's come out, I think, not this session, but the session before, uh, like, what's that, 2017. Um, and yes, that is a and is there a standard form to help survivors assert their rights there is not not that i'm aware of um that that would be wonderful but um but if working with an attorney if there's you know um a way if it's already in the court process if there's a way to file a motion um that's something certainly that an attorney could prepare um something that i could assist uh, a civil attorney with if that's if, if that comes up but um, back to the, the prior question about the seven APOs, that's, that's, um, that's in the PowerPoint. I do have a site, I know, on that slide. And specifically, it, 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 it's in there. Um, and if, it, again, if you need me to send you the actual statute, I, I absolutely can. Um, prosecutors are supposed to say where, um, which court they can file in and, and offer, if they want it to be done, that they are supposed to do it. Okay, Mr. Statement about getting a copy of the PowerPoint. Yes, uh, you absolutely can get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, okay, more questions. Again, is the SANE exam supposed to start before the advocate arrives? Um, no, it is not supposed to start before the advocate arrives. The whole point of the law is for the advocate to be in the room from the beginning. So again, if there's any issues uh, that arise with the, the victim deciding to you know, to stop uh, or take a break or any of that, you know, that's the support that an advocate can provide. 
Um, yes. Okay. I, I, Adriana, I will definitely send you the statute on the 7A stuff for sure. Um, she has more questions. I know. I'm, I'm trying to go back and see if I've missed any. No. Okay. I've gotten them all so far. Okay. Yes, you're welcome. You're absolutely welcome for, for the information, and I would be happy to, to talk to you further if you have um, anything else. Okay, so what can you do if, as an advocate, you arrive and the exam has started? I think, practically speaking, you don't want to, you know, throw a fit and, you know, make any accusations in the moment. I think sometimes we have to be um, careful about uh, making this an issue uh, an additional issue that the survivor has to deal with in that moment, but it's certainly something to bring up after the fact in outside the presence of the victim with that sane nurse and, you know, advise them, um, show them the statute and say, this is the requirement that, you know, for so for the next time, they don't make that same mistake. And if this is a continual problem that they continue to violate this over and over, even after being told, I do think that's something where you may have to take it to a higher power, maybe meet with the um, the hospital administration, you know, take it higher to let them know this is a this is a risk. You're putting yourself at risk, especially a hospital, because they can be sued. Right. It's hard to sue a law enforcement agency for failure to follow crime victims rights. But uh, hospitals, they don't have immunity. Right. Same nurses don't have immunity. So um, they could be sued. If, if it came down to it. So talking to, you know, the administration in, in the hospital what might be the next step if, in fact, you're having a problem after you've tried to be nice and educate. If they still violate the law, then, then I think that would be your next step on that. So for return of evidence, does victim have to request? Yes, um, a victim should um, make that request if, if, they, if they're wanting to have that returned. And um, you're welcome for the, absolutely, lots of thank yous. You're welcome, you're welcome. Um, can you please email the PowerPoint? I can, I do think you will get it. They will get it um, in an hour. But if you do not get it, I would be happy, more than happy to email it to you. So 100% um, send me an email if you don't get it and I will be happy to email. I just, I don't have everybody's contact and emails in front of me, so I don't know if you aren't getting it or whatever. So you just, you just need to let me know and I'll be happy to send it out. And a uh, recurring issue in the county I provide accompaniment in. Um, I am sorry to hear that, you know, and I think you're not alone. I think it's something that a lot of counties are dealing with. I think it's because they don't understand what the law says. And there's, it's just, they go on status quo. This is just what we do in this place. You know, this is, this is just how we handle things. And it's, and it's not right. And it's not right. We need to be the ones to say, stop it. This is the law, follow the law. <laughs> so, um, Okay, you mentioned the victim's phone number when they get a pseudonym should not be included in the court files. What about the police report? Yes, no, should not be included in any any of the documents. Okay, so um, the um, if the police report is included in the court file, then no, that should be redacted. Um, and you're welcome for, for the PowerPoint, 100%. My understanding is that to request a defendant to be tested for HIV, a conviction has to have happened. I don't believe it says that in the law. I will double check that for you and get back to you. Um, I don't recall seeing that in the statute. Um, and I was just looking at it last night, just kind of refreshing and, and getting ready for today. I don't, I don't think that's true, but that may be a practical matter what is done, but that doesn't mean that that's required in the law. So let me double check on that and I will get back to you on that. You've made attempts in the past, that's been the DA's response, I see. Well, I, I will definitely look at it. It sounds like you and I will have a conversation after this. Um, <laughs> okay, so we have an issue with newspapers reporting assault, including identifiable. Uh, uh, no, they're not supposed to be doing that for sure. And I think if that's the case, um, then as a routine matter, you need to talk to survivors about using pseudonyms um, and, and potentially um, talking to someone in that newspaper station uh, or 
or station, whatever it is, newspaper office. Um, yeah, that that's not okay. That's not okay. I'm assuming we're talking about adult survivors, but still, because of course minors is a whole nother whole nother thing. So PowerPoints will come out. Any any other? Okay, name is not included. Wait, uh, name is not included, but they will print ex-wife. You really don't need the name to know who it is, I see. Yeah, that's a harder situation. Um, I mean, I think that that's an opportunity to talk about, you know, um, sensitivity to victims' issues um, with that reporter, you're going to have a harder time with just kind of vague labels. I, I, I hear what you're saying in a small town. It, it you know, it's pretty obvious who, who's, who they're talking about. Um, and it may be something that, you know, could be uh, something that a civil lawsuit could address. But um, I think that is going to be a harder one to deal with. We have a problem with a county that fails to contact victims about anything once a crime has occurred if it is a DV. So, yeah, I mean, they, are you saying that they don't even provide the information form that they're supposed to provide or they're, they're are we, and are we talking about the law enforcement? Are we talking about um, the prosecution office? I mean, that that is a problem. Obviously, they're supposed to be given loads of information, like, like they should be swimming in, in information according to our crime victims rights statute all that do not contact or well all that okay do, they don't they don't contact them or give them information that's something that i would i would urge you to have some conversations with both of those offices you know and and point out some of these very specific very specific statutes this is seven of the eight counties we cover. Oh, jeez. Um, yeah. Is it, okay, so that came from somewhere else. Hang on a second. So I'm seeing Cassandra just said seven of the eight counties, but then Colleen's the one that, so I'm not sure. Are you guys talking about the same counties? No. Okay. No, sorry. Um. I mean, you know, the, the law is pretty straightforward. They're supposed to be given this information. And um, as as you're standing up for their rights, you know, you just you have to you have to be a kind of a thorn in their side and, you know, nicely. Right. But you have <laughs> you have to say, um, guys, you you have a duty to do this and point out those provisions in the law. Um, you know, because if, if you don't, who will, right? And and things just don't ever change. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to help provide support in, 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 in that and if you need it. And um, I urge you to call us if, if you have specific things like that that you'd like some direction on or, or even some regional support. We have people, uh, staff that, that are all around the state in El Paso and Houston, down in San Antonio, up in uh, Dallas, um, that that are there to provide that support to y'all. So, um, you know, we we just encourage you to call us and and help. Let us help. Um, we'll we'll think it through and and come up with some creative solutions. Here in Austin, you know, there's a group of survivors who brought a lawsuit against the city uh, for failure to protect their crime victims' rights. So, like, it can be done. It, it may it may need some resources thrown at it, um, but but it can be done. And I think always, it's always an option to talk to your, your legislator. Um, so yeah, I mean, you definitely want to be, you know, diplomatic as we're talking to our, especially our legislators. We definitely don't want to, you know, be offensive and rude, um, but you should absolutely, you should absolutely be um, speaking up when you see these injustices occurring. Yeah. 
So, all right, guys, we're reaching the end of our hour. Um, I appreciate all of the questions because that makes it very engaging. I'm glad that um, some of this information maybe is going to be helpful to some of you. Um, and, you know, we're, we're always here. So please do give us a call, email, and um, we look forward to hearing from you. I'm going to go ahead and close us out if we don't have any other questions. Y'all have a great day and um, look forward to, to next week's webinar on, do we know? I know, but I don't know <laughs> at the moment. Just remember that in an hour, you will okay. get a follow-up email and in that email will be the evaluation and a link to the PowerPoint and a link to the certificate of attendance. Thank you so much, y'all. Have a wonderful day.